we were about telling the story of underrepresented communities, stories that had high artistic integrity, and stories that had commercial viability. So that's the triad of the qualifications of the things that we do. That's actor, producer, and CEO of Simon Says Entertainment, Ron Simons. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced from the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Ron Simons is unstoppable. He's an actor, film and television producer. His films have been selected for Sundance four times. He is also a four-time Tony Award-winning producer. And he's the founder and CEO of Simon Says Entertainment. These are great accomplishments by any standard, but they're extraordinary when you realize Simons began his career in the arts at the age of 39. Previously, he had been a highly successful businessman, working for companies like Hewlett Packard and Microsoft. He hasn't lost that business savvy. He combines it with his love of storytelling in the arts. And the result has been innovative, cutting-edge film and great theater. His Tony Award-winning Broadway credits include Porgy and Bess with Audra McDonald, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, and most recently, August Wilson's towering play, Jitney. And Jitney is where I began my conversation with Ron Simons. Well, Ron Simons, I have to begin by congratulating you for winning your fourth Tony Award for Jitney. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was stunned to learn it hadn't been produced on Broadway previously. As was I. It was funny because about uh, maybe three years before we premiered at MTC, I got a call from Anthony Chisholm, who is in our production, and he said, we've got to bring this to Broadway. And I said, yeah, it's a great, I love this idea, and... uh, I said, uh, I, I don't remember the first production. He said, oh, no, this, there was no first production. This would be the first production on Broadway. And I was like, that can't be. And, uh, yeah, so it's ironic that the first play that August Wilson wrote was the last to appear on Broadway. And equally stunning to me was the fact that Sweat was Lynn Nottage's first play on Broadway. I know, right? I I completely agree. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer um, who's had extraordinary uh, profile and success and is a gifted writer. And the fact that she just now is having her Broadway premiere, it's like, wow, it's crazy. Tell me what went into producing Jitney on Broadway. What, What was your job as the producer of that play? Well, I have to give most of the credit to MTC and... And that's the Manhattan Theater Club. Manhattan Theater Club, that's right. And the director, Ruben Sandiaco Hudson, who, even as I was having my conversation with Anthony, um, they were cajoling and trying to figure out how and when they, we would collaborate on bringing it to Broadway. I came up on, on the project probably only a year prior to its uh, premiere. So my role was relatively muted considering the bulk of the heavy lifting had been done prior to my coming on board. But as most co-producers on Broadway, our job is to really provide advisory information or counseling for the production. And I got to tell you, MTC is pretty smart. They know what they're doing. So my, my, my producing partner, Eric Falkenstein, and I, we lean quite heavily upon their expertise because, as you may know, Manhattan Theater Club is this unique combination of both what's often thought of as a regional theater that has a full season programmed as well as being a Broadway house and there aren't very many of those so their work is because it's Broadway is eligible for Tony Award consideration. Now you had a long career in business before you moved into theater and film. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you did as a business person. Well, when I first graduated from college, I was a software development engineer, and I started my career as an engineer at Hewlett Packard, uh, developing software systems for manufacturing companies. I did that for a number of years. Then I joined in a, a company called IntelliCorp, which developed artificial intelligence-based software systems. And my job was to go out and consult with Fortune 500 companies like General Motors and Chrysler and Morton Thiokol and help them understand how they could use artificial intelligence to help improve their business practices. So I did that for a number of years, and then I came back to school, and I got my MBA in marketing 
uh, and international business at Columbia. And when I graduated from Columbia, then I moved to Seattle and began work as a uh, as a product manager at Microsoft. And I oversaw the Microsoft mail product line back when email was not ubiquitous. It wasn't everyone had it. Businesses had it, but most people on the street did not have an email account. That's how long ago that was. I'm showing my gray hairs there, but and then after I left that company, I decided that it was time to stop deferring the dream, and the dream was to become an actor. And I left Microsoft and started acting around town, and uh, finally decided I should go get a degree and understand the business and the art of acting. And I enrolled at the University of Washington Professional Actors Training Program, and I studied acting for three years, and then graduated and came here to start my career as an actor. And tell me about your career as an actor. Well, my time as an actor continues. Um, I actually left an audition to come here for the, this interview this morning. So I'm, I continually change my hats. Some, some, some days or some hours or some minutes, I'm wearing my actor hat, and sometimes uh, alternating minutes or days or hours, I wear my producer hat. So I started out as a company member up at the Classical Theater of Harlem here in New York City. And after hoofing it for a couple of years, I finally got an agent. Interestingly enough, the first audition that I had for my agent was for Law & Order, which I had been sending that production office my headshot and resume since I landed in New York because it was believed then that you weren't a real actor unless you've been on Law and Order, right? So, and of Absolutely. course, they would they wouldn't give me the time of day. I'd never heard anything. So I got my first audition with them, and I booked it. And I, and I kind of want, I was thankful, but I wanted to say, you know, I'm still that same man that had been sending you this stuff for the last two years. I could have been here like a year and a half ago, but I let that go because that's the nature of the business. Um, and now I, I do film and do television. Uh, I do voiceover work as well. Essentially what most actors do, if it requires acting and you'll pay me and it doesn't require complete nudity, I'll consider it. Yeah, exactly. You want me to ski down that alp on one foot? Yeah, I, I could do that. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. No worries. <laughs> what was the appeal about acting? You know, I got to tell you, this is the thing about acting. I thought about this when I was in grad school. And I was like, why are you here? What, you know, because it's, ch- it's a challenging thing. And, you know, I left a lucrative career in business to pursue my degree in acting, much to my to the chagrin of my mother. I was going to say, what did your mother say? About yeah, it, my mother was like, um, first of all, when I took the job at Microsoft, <laughs> I told her, I said, well, Ma, I got this job. It's this really great company called Microsoft. She never heard of it. I said, and I said, I think I'm going to really work on some interesting technology. I said, but the thing is I have to take a 20% cut in pay to go work at Microsoft from what I was making before I got my MBA. And she said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you take a cut in pay? And I said, I know, but I think there's an upside to this. I think it's a strategic move for my career, da, da, da. So she was like, well, you know, I don't think it makes any sense, but you have to do what you have to do. Okay, fine. So then five years later, I'm like, so, Mom? I'm leaving Microsoft, and I'm going to become an actor. What do you mean? You can't leave Bill Gates. Bill Gates, this is one of the most important, significant companies in the world, and you're talking about leaving it? So, But, you know, you also have to understand that my mother, for years, because I was the product manager for Microsoft Mail, my mother was absolutely convinced that I worked in the mail room. And I tried to explain to her, mother, no, I don't work in the mail room. I'm the product manager of Microsoft Mail, which is some software. She never really quite got that, and years after I had left Microsoft, she would ask me, so, baby, tell me, how did you, why did they fire you from the mail room at Microsoft? <laughs> I'm like, Mama, never mind. So anyway, what was, what was the original question I think of? What drew time? you to acting? So, right, so in, in soul searching about why I was doing this thing, what I realized is that it really wasn't about the praise and, and the, you know, being in front of people because I oscillate between an extrovert and an introvert. So I don't need to be seen, but what I do love are two things. I love storytelling, and I, I've always been a storyteller, and I love telling stories. That was the one thing that fed my soul. But the other thing is, is that when you're acting, there's no other thing that I do or very few things that I do in my life where I am consistently in the moment when I'm doing it. And with acting, I am always in that moment at that place with that person in that time under those circumstances. I'm not worried about what happened yesterday. I'm not planning my grocery shopping list for tomorrow. I am literally in this moment, and there is something, there is something alive and, and, and a feeling of, 
of electricity, of, of, of being in the right now that is so invigorating to me that it's addictive. It's kind of like a, it's like a life's crack. I don't know. I, it's just the thing that really makes me feel like I am present and I'm alive. And, and for that, there's no substitute. That's very well put. Um, tell me about the move to producing. As an actor around town, I, of course, did a number of readings for playwrights. And uh, I had met some extraordinarily gifted, talented playwrights, a number of playwrights, and I found that their work was kind of caught in this workshop and reading hell, right? It was, they were workshopped, and then there was a 29-hour reading, and then there was another workshop, and, and they weren't getting the production that I thought that they were ready for. That was the next step. So I said, you know what? I see all this stuff that's on Broadway and off-Broadway. It's being greenlit. I'm like, you know what? I want to help get the stories that I appreciate on stage. So I said, I'm going to be a producer. Now, I had absolutely no idea what a producer did. You probably know more now than I did then. But I said, I'm going to do this. And I kind of put that out in the universe, and I told friends that I'm going to be a producer. And then, interestingly enough, the first project that came my way from a schoolmate, Elliot Williams, for which I thank him for, uh, was in fact a film. And I was thinking that I was going to do plays initially. And uh, when I read the script, I fell in love with it. I thought I'd never seen this story told. It was what became Night Catches Us, starring Anthony Mackie and Kerry Washington and Wendell Pierce. And it was a dynamic ensemble of actors. And it was a story that was set in the 1970s in Philadelphia about two former Black Panthers who reunited and tried to rekindle a love affair with this triad of forces that were pulling them apart. And I'd never seen essentially a, a, a family drama and a love story set where the lens was through the Black Panther Party. And growing up in Detroit, I know that the Black Panthers had one profile within the African-American community and then a very different profile uh, within the white community. And I know that many people believe that Black Panthers were these beret-wearing leftist revolutionaries who were violent and all about killing police officers when in, in point of fact that was not at all the case. So though we don't tell the story of the Black Panthers, uh, we tell this story through the lens of the Black Panthers. So that was very educational because of a, a series of unfortunate incidents. I ended up becoming the producer uh, of, the sh of the film, which was not my intent when I started out. I was going to associate producer. We hired a producer. A whole bunch of really ugly things happened. and then, But we got the film made. I was very proud of it. And I said, well, that was that. I'm done. That was way too hard. I'll never do this again. There's no point. I'm just going to act. And so I was done. And then I had dinner with a friend of mine who was also a company member of the Classical Theater of Harlem. And uh, he was at uh, NYU getting his degree in film, and we were just talking about, you know, what was going on in his life, and he was telling me about his thesis project. And I said, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Can I read it? And he said, sure. So I read it, and then I was like, oh, my God, we've definitely got to do this. This is, this is amazing. I've never seen this story. And then, of course, I was back to the races, and now, what, six, seven, eight years later, I'm still producing. Now I'm doing not only film, but Broadway and some off-Broadway, and now venturing into television. And we should say that that film, Night Catches Us, was picked picked up by Sundance. That's right, which was extraordinary to me because... Not you know, bad for a first out of the box. I love, exactly. I mean, who gets their first film, you know, at the most prestigious domestic film festival in the country? Well, apparently it was us. So we had a great team, though. So I, I, I don't take credit for it. I take uh, I really congratulate the creatives who whose vision it was. And uh, my job is always as producers to help them realize their vision. Well, let's let's talk about literally what you did as a producer for Night Catches Us. <laughs> okay, well, it it, <laughs> it was kind of soup to nuts. Now, when I came aboard the project, there were a number of talents associated with the film, and a good number of them did, ended up not being associated with the film because you know schedules all were, are always changing, and we're dealing with creatives and very popular artists. You know, they have these things like concerts that they have to, you know, do or tours or what have you, or they're dropping an album or they're doing another show on Broadway or dot, dot, dot. So any production, whether it's film or television or stage, is all about scheduling. So my job as a producer and the job of most producers for a feature film is to essentially operate as a chief executive or chief operating officer, which is to say that we have to go out and actually hire the staff, the legal firm that's going to represent you, 
and then contract with all the components of the film that require agreements. That means all the cast, that means all of the crew, that means you need to hire the locations manager to figure out where it's going to be shot, working closely with the director. Not so much in the case of this film, but in other films it's all also about raising the money, which is often the biggest part of the puzzle to get started to make the film happen. And then, of course, it's also about the script, um, because I'm a creative producer, and by that I mean I can deliver a film on budget and on time, but what really gets me excited is the story itself, because I'm an actor and a storyteller. So with that screenplay, as is often the case with, with the screenplays that I work on, depending on where they are when I join, my goal was to help the writer-director finesse the script so that the character arcs and the story arcs were clear and, and well-defined, and and that the pacing was consistent with what I thought that would lead to the, a quality film. So that process is something that is it's unique in the sense that many producers opt for one or the other. They don't have a lot of business experience, but they really understand the creative side, or they really understand the creative side, but they couldn't deliver a film on budget or on time. So I was blessed to have had the experience and background in both business, so I can look at a spreadsheet and gauge the health of an entity, but I also, as a storyteller, can understand why a script is not as clear as it could be or is not as compelling as it should be or is not constructed in a way that would best tell the story. Now, you began Simon Says Entertainment. Yes. What was the thinking that went into that? Well, when I first started, I was really not about the company. When I started, I said, you know, I just want to produce. I don't want to make quality I want to see these amazing stories come to the fore. So since I didn't know what producers did, someone said to me, you should probably incorporate something, do an LLC or an S-Corp, so that you can have a layer between your resources and uh, the company that is going to be producing the film that you're doing. So at the time, I really wasn't sure I was going to be a producer long term. It was going to be a test case. So when I started, I was really just a, a sole proprietor, though I actually did incorporate as a company. But by the time I got to my second film and realized that I'm just not going to be a, you know, a one-horse wonder, I'm really going to focus on this and actually make a go of it, then I decided that I needed to make sure that I had a mission statement and, and a focus of what the kind of stories that I knew I liked and wanted to tell. And that has always been in the core of who we are, right? The core of who we are is about telling the stories of underrepresented communities. Again, the stories that I was seeing not being told as frequently as an actor, um, but I thought were worthy of production and sharing with the world. But also, more recently, it's important to focus on the commercial viability of projects. I think at the very beginning, I was really about passion projects that I thought were unique stories that were untold, all of which talked about the human condition and in, in many ways all the same universal themes that every film and play and book touch upon. But in every instance, in every play, every book, every movie, you just change the lens through which you look at this universal truth or universal human condition. And so when I finally realized that I was going to be doing this for a while, I realized that there were three things that we were about. We were about telling the story of underrepresented communities, stories that had high artistic integrity, and stories that had commercial viability. So that's the triad of the qualifications of the things that we do. And in terms of how we want to impact theater goers or our audience, we want to educate, we want to entertain, and we want to inspire. So those are the guiding missions for the company. And it's by that standard I judge what stories we tell, and how we tell them, and where we tell them. You know, it's interesting. Well, interesting is actually it's the very wrong word for it, but it's it's clear that people of color, particularly African Americans, tend to be underrepresented both on the screen and on the stage, but absolutely behind the scenes. And an African American producer, that's so rare. Sadly, it is very rare. It's rare uh, in film, and it's even more rare for Broadway. And that's the reason why I sit on almost every diversity committee every organization that I belong to has, which is not only the Producers Guild of America, but also the Broadway League. And I also have 
you know, informational seminars for aspiring producers of color. I think I'm going to expand that for not only aspiring producers of color, but, you know, producers who are disabled and women. And I'm going to do that because the umbrella under which Simon Says operates is not as narrow as most other production companies. Most of the production companies, if they focus on something, they focus on African-American filmmaking or they focus on Asian-American plays or they focus on LGBTQ. And Simon Says is about the full umbrella of all underrepresented communities. So I get uber excited when I see stories about a disabled character, LGBTQ, seniors. I'm doing a documentary now called Viva Verde profiling the lives of residents of Casa Verde, which was opened by Giuseppe Verde, who left the composer, who left his life savings to open this home for composers, singers, musicians, etc., etc. So for me, it's really important to try to grow those ranks because I just feel that it's really important for the people who are deciding what we see on stage and on screen is as diverse as the audience's who go to see that content. So that's why I'm here. But at the same time, I'm not trying to do the next Marvel film. I think that the people who do Marvel do an amazing job, and I go to every Marvel film that comes out every year, bar none, because I'm that kind of guy, and I love the genre. But they got that down. I want to tell the other stories that maybe are not often told. Well, I think it's, it's as you say, what, what I find so paradoxical about art, about literature, about theater, film, is that the more individual the story is, the more precise, somehow the more universal. universal. I couldn't agree more. That is that you have, uh, that's very perceptive, and I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. It's counterintuitive, right? Because you think that if you look at, for example, my second film, which was called um, Gun Hill Road, now, Gun Hill Road was about a Puerto Rican dad who comes home to a Dominican wife who's having an affair and a teenage son who's transgendering. Now, I had never seen that story, which is why I got so excited about it, and I decided to produce it. And we worried that because of the characters in the film and the circumstance in which they operate, that it would alienate some viewers and that we might find it difficult to, for example, appeal to audiences of people of color, particularly men of color, because as you know or may know that, you know, in communities of color, particularly African-American, Latino communities, machismo plays a, a, an unfortunately too large a role in terms of what defines manhood and, you know, what does it mean to be a good man. And what we found out was that because it was so specific that that allowed the audience to draw parallels directly to their lives, though they... In test screenings, you know, we had Latino and black men who I thought were just completely tuned out, were completely engaged, and whether the theme was fatherhood or love that was their entree into the film, the specifics, though they knew nothing about transgendering, that specific opened a door for them so that they could partake in the film and bring their own history, their own experience to the fore, and it could affect them in a way that if it were a great generality, it would not have done so. So part of what you want to do, and if I'm misstating this, please please correct me, but you want to bring new voices into the pipeline, have new stories, shine a light on new stories. Absolutely. That is exactly what I want to do. That's exactly what and I think we've so far, knock on wood, been able to do. We just don't want to do more. What are some of the challenges of putting a spotlight on those new voices? Yeah, well, a couple of different things. If it's, it's the storyteller, the challenge is distributors, sales reps, financiers, they are hesitant to support either first- or second-time filmmakers because they're not a, as proven a commodity, let's say, as you know, long-standing storytellers. So it can be difficult in finding financing for a film where the filmmaker doesn't have a history to it. But as I tell filmmakers all the time, what's important from a producing point of view is that you always work towards increasing the prestige of the project. And that, if that means that you don't have a, an Academy Award winning or award winning or very experienced screenwriter, director, then you want to get someone who is an executive producer whose name might either carry weight or might have some kind of recognition in the marketplace. 
or you want a DP, a director of photography, who has no has been known to have an extraordinary eye and who is well regarded by the industry, and you want to submit it to festivals for screenwriting competitions, such as Sundance and uh, you know a number of other f- festivals around the country, and so. That's one of the challenges when you're dealing with young filmmakers and storytellers is getting the money and getting the resources to believe in them the way you believe in them. What's next for you? Oh, boy. You know, as a producer, a producer always has to have a number of projects um, on the (laughs) stove waiting to go because you never know when it goes from yellow to green light. But I've got a number of projects. One of them is uh, I was just... Literally moments before this interview, I was sitting in the lobby and I was talking to our team about Jitney, and uh, we were trying to figure out the best next steps for that project. Ideally, we'd love to transfer it to another Broadway house um, so that more people can see that production, which we felt was just extraordinary. So if we get to transfer that, um, but it may be a tour that might be the next thing. We're looking at the economics of that right now. I'm also producing the Broadway production uh, transfer of Turn Me Loose. Starring Joe Morton from Scandal. Oh, the Dick Gregory? The Dick Gregory piece, right. It's about the life uh, and times of comic genius and civil rights activist Dick Gregory. So it's this really beautiful hybrid of drama and hilarity. It's amazing. But anyway, I'm developing that. So we're moving that to Broadway next year. With Joe Morton. With Joe Morton, who is a powerhouse. He is a beast when it comes to storytelling, and he brings some of his finest work to this play, I have to say. And the third project that I'm bringing to Broadway is entitled Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and it's a musical about the Temptations. And we're premiering it this fall at the Berkeley Rep and transferring it next year, 2018, to Broadway. And I got to tell you, I this is probably the most commercial property for Broadway that I've ever produced. And I'm, I feel very fortunate to be associated with this amazing creative team. You don't really appreciate the number of hits that The Temptations have until you hear them back to back to back to back in a two-hour period. You talk about a toe-tapping good time. So those are the three things that I'm doing for Broadway coming up for next year. I've got uh, a number of films that I'm in developing. One um, is actually a screenplay written by Joe Morton called um, Black Swallow. It's an inspiring story, sweeping tale of an extraordinary human being who had some extraordinary accomplishments. And uh, I'm very excited about bringing that story to the fore. Um, I'm also developing this sci-fi teen film, sort of a thriller, uh, called Entangled. And um, in post-production, though it's not my company, this is Ron Simons, I have a film adaptation of one of my favorite playwrights, which is The Seagull, starring Annette Bening, who is just, there are really no words for her performance in this film. Um, and Chekhov is one of my favorite playwrights, so I jumped at the opportunity to work with Tom Hulse, um, who was one of the producers on the film, and ironically is the man who f- gave me my first professional acting job years ago at Seattle Repertory Theater when he directed The Cider House Rules. And then, of course, I'm in post-production for Viva Verdi, which is uh, the piece that I referred to earlier about the senior residence of Casa Verdi in Milan, um, and it really explores how the third act of one's life could be the most inspiring. Okay, I look forward to it. And Ron, thank you. It was such a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, it was a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for the invitation. That's Ron Simons, actor, producer, and CEO of Simon Says Entertainment. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>